Chabant. I'm the Chief Executive of an organization called Cigna Advisors. We are specialists in Black Economic Empowerment Advisory Services. And I'm here to talk to you today about the BEP or Built Environment Professionals strategy for black empowerment. Uh, this is a particularly relevant topic at the moment because the construction sector is required to align its BEE policies to the new codes that were recently released. But by way of introduction, uh, let me tell you a little bit about our group, Cigna. Cigna Advisors is made up of a number of divisions that assist our clients in managing their BE compliance. Our first, um, our first focus with any organization is to help them with executing a BE strategy um, that makes sense to the business and allows them to achieve high degrees or high levels of BE compliance. Within our strategy division, we have an equity division that looks after black ownership and in particular assists companies in implementing broad-based or employee ownership uh, transactions. Our compliance division specializes in skills development and employment equity compliance. Our, um, our, academy, uh, our academy provides CETA accredited learnerships for companies and in particular we, um, we specialize in providing uh, disabled learnerships um, for people that were previously unemployed. Um, this makes a significant difference in our community um, as we currently have in the region of 350 learners at our campus uh, of which 150 are, are people that are living with disabilities. Um, and then our people division specializes in the recruitment and placing of senior, middle and junior management with a focus on employment equity um, or, or affirmative action candidates that uh, um, have skills and expertise to add value to our clients. Today we're going to be talking about the amended BE codes of good practice and in particular a strategy for built environment professionals to be able to manage the transition from the existing construction sector codes to the aligned and amended uh, construction sector codes. It's particularly important that um, before we all blow BE out of proportion that we understand the context in which companies uh, have to comply from a BE perspective. Now, the amended BE codes of good practice that came into effect in October 2013 um, have changed the BE thresholds or the, or the qualifying thresholds that companies are required to meet before they have to comply with the BE legislation. And it's very important that we understand that um, government is not trying to uh, place a burden on small businesses to comply with BEE. And to this end, the threshold for uh, exempt micro-enterprises has been increased from 5 million rand to 10 million rand. At last count, the receiver of revenue indicated that there are 924,000 odd businesses that are VAT registered vendors. Now what that means is those companies have a turnover in excess of a million rand or more. What's interesting is of those 924,000 companies, approximately 878,000 of them have a turnover that's below the 10 million rand threshold. Now what that means in practical terms is that those 878,000 entities, in other words 95% of the total population of, of, of companies that are trading in South Africa, 95% of businesses are exempt from BEE in terms of the new dispensation. So a lot of companies uh, you know, see the, the, the BEE rules as being quite punitive or, or quite difficult to adhere to and yet most of them are below the, the turnover threshold of 10 million rand. And what that means then is those entities are automatically BE compliant. Now, it's really the 5% of entities that have turnovers in excess of 10 million rand that have to consider the effects of BEE. Um, so it's important that companies understand this context. Now, for built environment professionals, your thresholds are different. And in your existing uh, BE legislation, in the existing codes of good practice for construction companies and built environment professionals, the, the threshold for exempt micro enterprise exempt microenterprises is as low as 1.5 million rand. And the problem with that is it means it's a much wider net uh, of companies that need to comply with BE, the BE legislation. We're going to talk a little bit more about the alignment process uh, later on, but it's important then for BEPs or built environment professionals to amend the threshold in the, in the alignment of your sector code to the new BE codes of good practice um, to be closer to the thresholds that are recommended. 
but we'll discuss that in a minute. Part of understanding the context of BEE is to also understand the legislation um, that surrounds BEE. So one of the most important pieces of legislation that is affected by BEE and in particular by your BEE scorecard is the Preferential Procurement Policy Framework Act. Now that's just a long, a long way of, of, of describing the, what we call the Triple PFA. And the Triple PFA is what guides businesses when they make uh, application for tenders at government. Um, so government have a, this uh, Triple PFA, the Policy Framework Act, that determines how they award tenders. And in this act, they have now aligned the, um, the empowerment criteria to the BE score of a company. So how that works is any business that is required to uh, submit a tender um, for government, for, for um, doing work for government, part of that tender submission would place reliance on your BEE certificate and the level you've achieved on your BEE certificate. And depending on that BEE level that you get, you will earn certain preferential points on your tender bid. Um, so if you can see for the first time, legislation that sits outside of BEE is now being aligned to the BE Act. Um, and what's really important is that a, an organization that, that gets, say, um, a level four on their BE certificate would earn five preference points on their tender bid, whereas an organization that gets a level three on their BE certificate would end up getting eight points on their preference bid. And it shows you how a BE level can influence the points that you earn in your tender bid. Now, what is the implication of that? The implication for a business owner is if I get a good BE score or a good BE level, I have the ability to be more competitive in my tendering process and potentially I can charge a higher price on my bid because I've made up my points with my BE level. So the, it's, it's important to now see the impact of BE or the BE level that you get um, on the rest of your business and your ability to grow and win business, uh, particularly with government. Another very uh, important piece of legislation that has changed recently is the BEE uh, Act. And we now have the BEE Amendment Act that was passed in January of 2014. That act, as of uh, August 2014, has not been signed by the President and therefore is not law applicable to government. However, um, industry has had the last eight months to determine or assess the impact of this potential legislation. And we're going to discuss some of the important clauses within the Act which will have implications for business. And I think that the first important clause to discuss is, the, is Section 10 within the Act which talks about the status of sector codes within BE legislation. Now this is particularly relevant to built environment professionals where you have your own construction sector code. And what's particularly important and what it says in the legislation is that Every organ of state and public entity must apply the relevant sector code when determining certain key things, such as the awarding of licenses or concessions, developing or implementing a preferential procurement plan and the tendering process that goes with it, developing criteria for public-private partnerships. So the legislation now, for the first time, is, is instructing government that if they want to deal with the private sector in any way, they have to apply the relevant BE sector code before they can engage in any commercial relationship with an organization. Another important point within Section 10 of the Act says that where an enterprise operates in a particular sector, you can only be measured according to that sector. And when dealing with government, you can only, the government can only place reliance on your BE credentials once it's been measured in terms of that sector code. So it shows the high level of importance that is now being placed on particularly built environment professionals to ensure that their current BE codes and the current construction sector code under which you operate is aligned to the new BE codes of good practice. Another particularly important um, aspect of the new Act, of the amended BE Act, is the definition of a fronting practice. And I think it's important to understand this because there are a lot of organizations um, that aren't clear on what really a fronting practice is. And the Act goes into some detail as, as to some of the practices that are not that obvious, which could be deemed to be a fronting practice. Now typically we all understand that if you uh, employ a low-level worker and call them a director or a shareholder in your business, but it's not true that that's fronting. But there are often more subtle ways of fronting where effectively um, 
companies are created or organizations are created that act as a marketing arm, um, which are black owned, and go out and win business, but all the business is then executed by the holding company. Typically, that could be a fronting, stru uh, fronting structure. Um, so it's very important that companies understand the definition of what is deemed to be a fronting structure. And why it's important to understand that is for two reasons. Number one, the legislation has now changed in the Amendment Act to suggest that anyone found guilty of a fronting practice can either, the company will either be fined a 10% of their turnover or the executives involved can go to jail for a period of up to 10 years. So the penalty clauses associated with any fronting practice are actually extreme. And for the first time, BE legislation has got real teeth because in the past, up until the, this act was, was promulgated, um, the only way that a person could complain or, or, or bring up an issue of fronting was to go to the, uh, the police and say there was a case of, and open a case of fraud. And we understand how difficult a process uh, like that can be. But now with the new uh, BE Amendment Act, there is a BE Commissioner that's been established. And any person can complain or lodge a complaint with the BE Commissioner accusing a person of fronting and provide evidence of that. And the BE Commissioner is obliged in terms of the Act to investigate that and prosecute where necessary. So for the first time, BE legislation has got a lot more teeth to it than it's had in the past. What's particularly interesting in the wording of the legislation is that the, the, the clause section 20 in the Act specifically uses the phrase, a person is guilty of an offence if that person knowingly misrepresents or attempt, attempts to misrepresent the BE status of an enterprise. And they go further to define this word knowingly. And in the definition of the word knowingly in the Act, they define it as a person knew or ought to have known. Now, by virtue of your position in the company, say as the MD or the, the CEO, if a fronting practice takes place in your organization and you are not aware of it, the fact that you hold a position of influence or control over that company means you ought to have known and means you can be prosecuted in terms of the, of the terms uh, in, the, in the Amendment Act. So there's far-reaching provisions um, have been made in the new Act which will be coming into law when the President signs, uh, signs the Act in the very near future. So now let's talk about the detail of the new uh, codes that have been promulgated and gazetted by the, the, the Department of Trade and Industry. These codes were um, made available for public comment in, from 2012 to 2013 and then were gazetted in October of 2013. And in the, the amended codes document is a provision that says that all sector charters and sector councils that represent particular industry sectors, and in, and in the case of built environment professionals, the construction sector industry. All sector councils are given a transition period to align their particular sector to the requirements of the new amended codes. Now, um, that transition period was extended from October 2014 to April 2015. So all sector charters and sector councils have the ability to align their particular sector, and this includes the construction sector, to the new BE Codes of Good Practice by 30 April 2015. Any organization that fails, or any sector charter or sector council that fails to align by 30 April 2015, the implication is that should a built environment professional firm want to get a BE rating, and they get their BE rating, say, in May or June of 2015, they will be required to be audited according to the generic amended codes of good practice because their sector council has failed to align their particular sector to the amended codes of good practice. So there's a, there's a very tight timeline between uh, the sector councils aligning their sector codes and, and having that done by 30 April 2015 um, and companies getting their BE rating so that they can claim a valid BE status according to their sector code. There are certain key principles as well that have been uh, discussed in the um, amended code and that is primarily that substance takes precedence over legal form and I think that's quite an important consideration because um, companies often say yes legally this works or legally this is correct but the substance of it doesn't support the objectives of BEE in which event the rating agencies or even the commissioner 
may look at the legal form and say, the legal form is not as important as the substance. And therefore, it's very important in engaging in any kind of BE activities that one investigate or, or ensures that the substance of what is taking place is true transformation and empowerment. Another key principle is that any, obviously any attempt to misrepresent your BE status or to provide false information is deemed as fronting. But the, the BE amendment codes go one step further. And they say that any initiative to split or separate or divide a business so that the each individual business unit's turnover is below that 10 million rand threshold, that process of splitting or dividing a business is also deemed to be fronting. And therefore the offence penalties kick in, which is potentially a 10% turnover fine or 10 years in jail. Another important change um, in the BE Amendment Act, and now applicable through the BE Amendment Codes, or the Amended Codes of Good Practice, is that all organs of state are now required by law to apply BE in their procurement processes. So any, um, any organ of state or or parastatal that does business is required to comply with the BE Act uh, and therefore apply the BE codes of good practice. Now up until now this hasn't been the case because the wording in the legislation allow, uh, they use the word may apply, it now must apply the BE codes of good practice. So the emphasis has shifted very much more from government ensuring compliance in its procurement processes with, with BE. So let's get into the detail of the new codes of good practice and what they mean and the implications potentially for construction companies and BEPs as you go through your alignment process. We're going to spend the next few minutes just discussing um, what the new codes say and potentially where there are opportunities within that for the construction sector and, and BEPs to align their sector code to the new codes of good practice. And what the new codes do for the first time is they introduce a concept known as priority elements. Um, and basically priority elements are, are, are elements identified within the codes as being elements with which all companies must comply. And if they don't comply with those elements, then there will be a penalty for non-compliance. The three priority elements that are mentioned um, in, the, in the new codes of good practice are ownership, skills development, and enterprise and supply development. The indication is that companies must at least comply with a minimum 40% compliance of those priority elements to avoid being penalized in terms of the legislation. Importantly, organizations that have, in, have turnover in excess of 50 million rand or more in the, in the amended codes of good practice are required to comply with all three of the priority elements, whereas companies that have a turnover between 10 and 50 million rand turnover are required to comply with the ownership element plus one of the other two. So they only have to comply with the two elements. But still, for large organizations, the, the requirement for compliance is significant. And for small organizations who up until now have not had to consider ownership are now required to look at ownership as a priority element. And that represents quite a significant shift from what companies are used to that operate in the, the qualifying small enterprise space. So I think it's important that we just discuss um, the, the existing thresholds that apply to BEPs in the existing construction sector code and compare that to what's happened now with the shift in, in the thresholds that the new BE codes are proposing. So, as it stands at the moment, built environment professionals applying your current construction sector code have a threshold from 0 to 1.5 million rand turnover per annum to qualify as an exempt microenterprise. Now, why that's important is, is it means that a company can go merely to the accountant or auditor and get a, a letter or certificate stating that their turnover is below 1.5 million rand and that is sufficient to give them a level 4 status or if it's a black owned enterprise a level 3 status. In the new codes of good practice that threshold has shifted from 5 million to 10 million. It's effectively doubled. Now what's interesting is that the built environment professional threshold is significantly lower the 1.5 million is significantly lower than the current 5 million threshold for exempt microenterprises. There is an opportunity therefore in terms of the alignment process for construction companies that they increase their microenterprise threshold and particularly for BEPs, built environment professionals, is to increase your, your, your threshold, your cutoff threshold for exempt microenterprises. The only problem is that it's going to be very difficult for the, the, the construction sector council to argue 
that we should shift the BEP threshold from 1.5 million right up to 10 million because that represents on an almost uh, six or seven folding increase. Whereas under the generic codes of good practice, it's merely doubled from 5 million to 10 million. Um, so it's likely that in the alignment process that built environment professionals will still have a, uh, an exempt microenterprise threshold that's significantly below 10 million rand per annum. But there is an opportunity now, between now and the 30th of April uh, 2015, for that threshold of 1.5 million to be shifted upwards. How far is, is subject to um, what the, the sector council proposes to the DTI and what the DTI accepts. The new BE thresholds, uh, the BE thresholds and the new, the new codes of good practice say that qualifying small enterprises ha um, have turnovers of between 10 and 50 million rand turnover per annum. Now that represents an increase uh, um, from 35 to 50 million at the top end of that threshold. In the built environment professional environment, however, that threshold is, is currently sitting at 1.5 million to 11.5 million. That 11.5 million is still significantly below the, the threshold that appears in the new codes of good practice of 50 million rand. Again, is it possible that in the alignment process that built environment professionals can shift their qualifying small enterprise threshold from 11.5 to 50 million? It's up to the, the Construction Sector uh, Council to argue that and for members of the built environment professional to argue that. But the logic, the logic of having higher thresholds is that more companies would be deemed to be exempt microenterprises and therefore claim an automatic level 4 status if they were white owned companies or uh, an automatic in, um, level 2 or level 1 status if they were black owned companies. Another significant change in the, in the thresholds and how they measured is that if a company if a white-owned company is below the threshold for an exempt microenterprise, it is immediately deemed to be a level 4 company. However, if a black-owned company that is 100% black-owned is an exempt microenterprise, it's immediately deemed to be a level 1 company. Now, obviously, why that's relevant is because in any, uh, when, when a BE certificate is considered for, for tendering purposes, a level 1 company gets 10 points, of its preference score in a tender, whereas a level four company gets five points in its preference score for, level, for, for a tender. So you can understand, therefore, the importance or, or the distinction between a level one and a level four. And obviously government is trying to incentivize buying goods and services or awarding tenders uh, when buying goods and services from black-owned companies. And you can see how that's coming through in, in the thresholds. If a company is 51% or more black owned, but not quite 100% black owned, then it automatically co uh, qualifies as a level two company if it's an exempt microenterprise. Um, the, the generic codes uh, have been amended in such a way that um, not only do black owned and 51% or more black owned microenterprises get the benefit of being a level one or level two, but those entities trading between 10 and 50 million rand turnover, which now are fairly reasonably sized organizations, get that same uh, exemption. That they can claim to, if it's 100% black owned, can claim to be a level one. If it's 51% or more black owned, can claim to be a level two without getting a BE rating because they get an automatic uh, BE compliance status. Now, there's also been a significant shift in how a company claims its black empowerment status. Currently, as it stands, if an organization wants to show that it's an exempt microenterprise, it has to go to its accounting officer, or auditor, uh, or even a rating agency and request a BE certificate to be issued. In the new legislation, there's a provision that says a company merely has to declare on an affidavit that its turnover is less than the threshold and its black, a black ownership status, and it can claim on its affidavit its BE level. So typically that means uh, a black-owned built environment professional firm that's trading say below a 1.5 million rand turnover can automatically claim on an affidavit that it's a level one company on its on its piece it doesn't require it doesn't require an auditor or a, or a rating agency to issue them with a certificate uh, and the, the reason for that is to try and reduce the cost of compliance for micro enterprises it therefore makes sense for black-owned companies to want to apply the new legislation as soon as possible because it means they can reduce the cost of their compliance and they can get a much higher level rating 
on their, on their BE certificate, or at least on their affidavit. The problem is that no rating agencies are able to accept affidavits because their terms of reference haven't been updated to allow them to accept affidavits as reasonable evidence. So there's a bit of a catch-22 at the moment in that the legislation on the one hand is saying, yes, you can claim a level 1 or level 2 status if you're black-owned, but on the other hand, no rating agencies are prepared to acknowledge those certificates because their scope of work has not been increased um, to allow them to accept them. This problem will go away from April, next, uh, April 2015 because at that point in time, the new codes will be an ob uh, obligatory on all organizations. So now let's look at the detail of the new scorecard that's proposed by, um, uh, in, the, in the amended codes of good practice. And importantly, there are only now five elements in the new scorecard versus the seven elements that, uh, that we've been used to. Those five elements include ownership, management control, skills development, enterprise and supply development, and socio-economic development. And we'll look at each one of those uh, individually. What's interesting to note is that in the amended codes of good practice, the emphasis on ownership has actually increased, and the number of points has moved from 20 to 25 points. And those extra five points are for companies that embrace broad-based ownership schemes like an employee ownership scheme or a community ownership scheme. So the the, the DTI is trying to incentivize companies to, to look at broadening the beneficiary base um, in their ownership. Now what's interesting, in the existing construction sector codes of good practice that applies to BEPs at the moment, there already is recognition, an extra recognition in your ownership scorecard for broad-based schemes. So I, I see very little opportunity for alignment um, because effectively the BEP and, and construction sector code as it stands is already very closely aligned to what is, uh, is recommended in the amended codes of good practice. The second element is uh, referred to as management control and in the amended codes of good practice this represents um, two elements that have been added together, namely management control and employment equity. So what we previously had as two separate uh, measurable elements are now consolidated into a single skills development um, the emphasis on skills development has also increased from in the, in the old codes, it was at 15 points, it's now 20 points uh, on the new, on the, in the new codes. And there's a further five bonus points available, um, which we'll discuss um, under that element. And then preferential procurement and enterprise development under the old codes have been added together into a single element now called enterprise and supplier development. And this is the biggest scoring element on the, on the new scorecard. Um, there's a total of 40 points available for enterprise and supply development and a further four bonus points um, for companies that engage in that process. And the last element, socio-economic development, um, was previously five points on the old scorecard and is still five points on the new scorecard and not, not much has changed there. So if one were to add up all the points available in the new scorecard, it's way more than 100 points. In fact, there's about 118 points available in the new scorecard which obviously gives companies the advantage in that where they engage in a transformation process um, and meet all the requirements to earn bonus points, they can get very close um, to, or get a very competitive BEE score. A big change from the old codes to the new codes has been a change in the recognition levels that are attributed to uh, the points that are earned in your scorecard. So previously, where a company scored, say, 65 points, uh, in terms of your BE audit, those 65 points would have earned you a level 4 status. Now, in terms of the new codes, with the change in the thresholds, 65 points will only earn you a level 7 status. So the impact is quite significant in that companies are now going to have to score much higher points to get back up to their level 4 status. Um, and the ramifications of that can be quite far-reaching because they are they already very large organizations in the marketplace and um, uh, governmental organizations that have an internal procurement policy that says we will not buy goods and services from companies that have a, a, a level status that is below a level four. Now the implication of that is should you be measured on the new codes and your levels automatically drop from level four to level seven, you would effectively be non-compliant with the procurement requirements of your customer and that could be far-reaching. Um, um, the research that Cigna has done in this space has indicated that those organizations that have set these thresholds are not prepared to adjust those thresholds downwards for the impact of the new codes. 
So potentially, companies who are currently uh, trading with government or, or with the large organizations um, on their level 4 status are going to be required to maintain that level 4 status going forward, which means on average they're going to have to score at least another 20 points on their scorecard to maintain that. Um, and that could be quite challenging for companies who feel they can continue doing BEE the same that they've been doing it up until now. So let's take a few minutes to look at what the new codes are proposing um, for, for ownership. And, and basically, nothing much has changed. The, the suggested targeted black ownership for an organization to score maximum points is still 25% uh, black ownership. Now, the only real change in the, in the new codes of good practice is that there's an introduction uh, for broad-based ownership schemes. And the thresholds are very low. An extra three points has been introduced into the ownership scorecard for ownership by black designated groups. The target is only 3% of the total ownership structure needs to be in the hands of black designated groups to earn the additional three points. Now what is a black designated group? These represent groupings that are either people who are youth, in other words under the age of 35, people who are disabled, people living in rural areas, people who were previously unemployed, or people that are, were military veterans or served as military veterans. If any of those groups of people make up some of the ownership within uh, your business structure, you will earn additional points for that. Furthermore, there's a further two points available if 2% of the ownership structure is made up of new entrants. And the new entrant criteria basically suggests that any individual that owns shares in a business that previously had not owned equity to the value of 50 million rand or more would qualify as a new entrant. So those are fairly, fairly uh, simple requirements to meet and to earn the additional five points. Interestingly, those con uh, conditions have already existed in the construction sector code, um, so built environment professionals should be familiar with, with uh, these amendments to the new codes. Where there is a significant change, however, is in the, in the importance attached to the net value calculation in the new codes. And basically it's at the net value area calculation where the penalty provision resides. And the indication in the in new codes of good practice is that where a company does not earn a minimum of 40% of the points available for net value, and in this example, or in the codes, it's, it's eight points, if an organization does not earn a minimum of 3.2 points for net value on its ownership scorecard, it will be penalized in terms of the provisions of priority elements. And that penalty is a one level drop from your BE status that you earn. And because you haven't earned the 3.2 points on your net value score, you will drop from the level you've earned by one level. So there's a much greater, greater emphasis now on ensuring that ownership structures result in legitimate transfer of ownership to black people over time so that the net value calculation yields a positive result of at least 3.2 points on your scorecard. So the question I always get asked is what is the minimum ownership structure I need in place to ensure that I meet the requirements of the new BE codes of good practice? And the answer is very simple. An ownership structure of 10% in a business is sufficient to meet the net, uh, to, to meet the net value requirements and avoid a one level penalty drop. And we often recommend to our clients to look within themselves at their employees to say an employee ownership scheme at a, with a 10% ownership in a business is sufficient to give you 13.4 points on your scorecard and avoid the one level drop. Management control is the second element on the new scorecard and it represents a combination between management control and the employment equity measures from the, old school, or from the old codes. What's particularly important is the emphasis that's been placed on aligning the measurement of management control in the new codes of good practice with your employment equity reporting that's submitted to the Department of Labor on an annual basis. Now for most companies that, uh, that employ less than 50 employees or less than 150 employees, the reporting requirements to the Department of Labor um, are not, are not, there's no requirement. But the BE codes specifically encourage companies that do not need to report directly to the Department of Labor 
that they still report internally on the same mechanism, on the same basis. Because that basis will be used by the rating agencies to determine your management control score. It's important that that is done accurately because the company's payroll will be looked at by the rating agencies to determine whether the classification of managers is correct in alignment with what they get paid and their level of experience. Um, and what's really interesting about uh, the management control scorecard now is that for senior, middle and junior managers, we, for the first time, government has introduced in the new codes of good practice that companies should look at the sub-race group demographics of those groupings. That means we no longer look at uh, black people as a collective, but we now look at Africans, coloreds and Indians and measure them separately in the new codes of good practice. Now the implications of that are far-reaching because many organizations operate in particular regions where there's a particularly dominant race group. Um, so for instance, businesses operating in KwaZulu-Natal would argue that they predominantly have an Indian uh, base of employees and, and people to draw from. Whereas people in the Western Cape would argue that they predominantly have a colored uh, population to draw from. Um, and in those instances where companies operate specifically in a region, in a region they may apply the regional demographics as reported by the, uh, the Commission for Employment Equity. Um, whereas companies that have a national footprint will be required to use the national demographic. So what the management control element is trying to measure is the management control at a board level um, and it looks specifically at both executive and non-executive directors and then at the senior top management of an organization. Now in most built, uh, BEP, built environment professional firms, that's a very flat structure. And the people that occupy the board are generally the same people that occupy the, the executive positions. And there's no, um, there's no requirement in the BE codes that you can't measure the same person in each of the measurement categories, provided they fulfill those roles. So you might have, for instance, uh, a management team and, and, and a board of directors of, say, four people, and those four people would get me measured as part of the board, they'd get measured as part of the executive, uh, the executive board and part of the executive management. Um, and therefore, effectively, what it means that should there be um, a black person uh, sitting on the board who is part of the executive team, who is part of the, uh, of the executive board, that black person would be measured three or four times on the management control scorecard. Um, and the codes make provision and allowance for that. What's interesting here, um, too, is that the, the, the target to earn your points for management control is suggested at 50% of the board or 50% of the executive management should be black people and at least 25% of should be black women. In this, in this instance, black is referred to as including all Africans, colors and Indians. Once we look below the executive level and we're looking at senior, middle and junior management, then uh, the sub-race uh, group demographics apply. Now, in the existing construction sector uh, scorecard, that exists for built environment professionals at the moment. There's a recognition that uh, the built environment professionals' uh, corporate structures are very flat, that there aren't many tiers of management. And um, in your alignment process, from aligning your sector code to the new BE codes of good practice, it's recommended that that classification remains and that you have just a single band of management that is measured as opposed to having senior, middle and junior management tiers. Furthermore, in the management control section of the new codes, there's points available for um, the recognition of disabled people. And here again, we look at black people as a collective. Um, and the recommendation or the target is that at least 2% of the total employee base in any company should be people living with disability um, to earn the points there. A much greater emphasis has been placed on the third element in the new scorecard, and that is on skills development. Um, and skills development is really where a built environment professionals feel the challenge of BEE um, because the development of, of skilled professionals is a critical need in the built environment professional space. And obviously the DTI is wanting to encourage companies to invest more in skills development. Um, they recognize that there's been a significant um, shortage in the development of particularly engineering professionals, um, that there's a significant um, um, problem in the education system in providing sufficient numbers of eligible young people to study engineering. And so they've 
they've placed an extended responsibility on organizations to take upon the mantle of doing skills development within their industry. And companies that engage in that process actively can earn um, BE points for it. Not only that, but there are certain tax rebates available that make the cost of doing skills development um, very low and very attractive for organizations. Now before a company can claim any skills development from a BE perspective, it's important that you meet the, the legislated requirements in the Skills Development Act and the Skills Development Levies Act. From a BE perspective, those requirements are listed to suggest that companies must uh, um, submit a workplace skills plan and their annual training report and their pivotal reports to their relevant CETAs before they can qualify to earn skills development points on their BE scorecard. They must have implemented, most importantly, priority training programs within their organization. When a company undergoes a BE rating, the rating agencies ask to see your priority skills program, which should be documented in your, uh, your annual training report and your workplace skills program. And companies that are not engaged in, 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 in implementing priority skills programs will not earn their BE points for skills development in spite of the fact that they may have spent a whole lot of money doing skills development. So it's critical that companies meet the, the legislative requirements around skills development as contained in the Skills Development Act so that in meeting that they qualify to earn their points from a BE perspective. In the new BE codes there's also uh, quite, a, quite a significant change from the old codes in that companies are now incentivized for the first time to engage in the skills development of people that are not necessarily employees of the company. Um, and there's, there, there are points available in the new scorecard for the engagement of learnership programs for unemployed people. And we'll discuss the detail uh, on that when we look at the scorecard in general. Uh, another very important um, addition to the new codes of good practice is that companies should actually keep a, a track of, their, of the learners and the skills development um, processes that they follow. And there's a a learner tracking, um, learner tracking is uh, required for companies to be able to claim their BE points for skills development. So where an organization is engaging in any kind of learnership programs, tracking of those learners is required. And at the end of the, of the learning process, where companies uh, can demonstrate that they've either employed learners or found a job for those learners, there are additional bonus points for a new, the new bonus points which they call uh, absorption bonus points. And it's basically for learners being absorbed into the workforce, which makes a lot of sense, companies can get additional bonus points. If one looks at the detail of the skills development, the most important or the most significant shift that's happened from the old codes to the new codes is the doubling of the target in terms of skills development spending. So in the old codes of good practice, uh, if a company spent 3% of its annual payroll in skills development activities, it could earn its full points. Now that target has shifted from 3% of its annual payroll to 6% of its annual payroll. Now in the built environment professional space, in your existing uh, construction sector code of good practice, that target is, is only 1.5% of your annual payroll or your levyable amount. Okay? Now that is significantly less than the old codes of good practice, which was 3%. But now the old codes of good practice have been replaced by the new codes, which suggests the target is now 6%. So it's highly likely that built environment professionals' existing target of 1.5% will also double to at least 3% when your sector code is aligned to the new codes of good practice. So organizations immediately uh, operating the BE space, BEP space, need to realize that the amount of spending on skills development is going to be substantially more than what, than what they've been used to. There are a few other little changes from the old codes to the new codes which are quite important because they can have a, a quite a significant impact on the skills development spending that companies are able to claim. And that is that the, the discretionary spending on um, activities like accommodation and travel costs incurred in delivering training have been limited to 15% of the total spending available. So where companies would engage in say um, an overseas training program and the bulk of the cost was accommodation and travel, that's now going to be limited to 15%. Um, a further change from the old to the new is that indirect in-house training no longer qualifies for recognition. Um, 
There's a, there's a skills development uh, learning matrix that's contained in the BE Codes of Good Practice. And the category G on that matrix um, now no longer qualifies for recognition for skills development purposes. Most importantly, however, is that the, the salaries and wages paid to learners that are either apprentices, learners, or on an, on an internship program, the salaries and wages paid to those individuals can be claimed as skills development. Now this is particularly important for built environment professionals. And the reason it's important is because the candidate phase that, that engineers go on from the time that they've had their qualification to the point, of, or, or they've had their degree, to the point that they get their professional qualification, that candidate phase is deemed to be an internship in terms of category C on that skills matrix contained in the BE Codes of Good Practice. And that means that the salary paid to those candidates for the period with, in which they are on their candidate program, those salaries can be claimed as skills development spending. And that means for most BEPs, reaching the target for skills development spending is reasonably achievable because one can claim the salary cost that is paid to your candidate engineer as skills development spending. Now we know that the skills development target is most likely going to double from 1.5% to 3% of payroll for built environment professionals. But it's still highly likely that even with that target doubling, claiming the salary cost of the candidate engineers whilst they're on the candidate program will exceed that 3% threshold and therefore most BEPs should achieve full marks for skills development in, in, in terms of the skills development spending. The challenge however is that again in terms of skills development and in terms of, of the learnership programs companies are going to have to apply the sub-race group demographics for measurement. Now we're still not clear on exactly how those sub-race groups are going to be measured but it means that companies that operate on a national footprint are going to have to get a blend of both African, colored and Indian people, male and female, to ensure that they can score their full points for skills development. To earn full points on a skills development scorecard according to the new codes of good practice, organizations have to engage in learnership programs with people that were previously unemployed. Um, now to do that, organizations would probably look at the most cost effective way of doing that to get the maximum BE points. And the receiver of revenues, the, the uh, SARS and receiver of revenue, have provided some very attractive tax rebates for companies that engage in learnership programs that are CETA accredited. So where an organization wishes to engage in, um, learners that were previously unemployed and put them on a learnership program, the tax benefits available to organizations that do it are so significant that the cost of implementing that kind of learnership program is very close to zero. And We'll show you in the, in the documentation that an organization that would, say, engage with a, a disabled person living with disabilities in a learnership program can effectively score uh, maximum points for uh, uh, skills development for people living with disability on their scorecard, plus score maximum points for uh, uh, learnerships for unemployed people, and earn the additional two points available in the management control section for having people with, uh, living with disabilities on their payroll. So in a typical situation where a company decides they would like to earn maximum points on skills development and apply to have learners on CETA accredited learnerships and are prepared to uh, invest in those learnerships, they can claim three tax benefits. The first tax benefit is the normal section 11a deduction for the expense incurred in registering a learnership program for a particular individual. So here a registered training provider would invoice the company for uh, delivering the learning program and that expense is claimable for tax purposes. Not only that, but uh, companies are encouraged to pay a stipend to the learners to encourage them to complete the program and understanding that these are learners that were previously unemployed um, and therefore would need to earn a, a very basic stipend to allow them to travel to the learning site, um, to buy food, etc. For, for themselves so that they can complete the learning program. On that basis, all those expenses are firstly claimable for skills development in the BE Codes of Good Practice and are all deductible under Section 11A of the Income Tax Act. The second tax deduction available uh, to companies that engage in these kind of learnership programs is the Section 12H deduction applied uh, in, the, in the Tax Act. 
And what, what this says is if you have a, a learner on a learning program, over a 12 month period you are able to claim a 60,000 Rand tax deduction against your taxable income. Now the, the net cash effect of that is 16,800 Rand. If you took 60,000 at the 28% tax rate, you get 16,800 Rand is the cash saving in your taxes. If that person happens to be a person living with disabilities, the Section 12H rebate is 100,000 Rand over a 12 month period, which means the net tax saving for that individual on a learning program is 28,000 Rand in after tax savings to your business. Finally, the third tax rebate that's available is for stipends that are paid to these individuals where the youth wage subsidy which came into effect in, uh, in January of 2014 allows companies to deduct, to deduct up to half of the stipend paid to a learner off their monthly PAYE. So the impact if you take these three tax savings is that in a typical learnership program for a person who was previously on the streets unemployed results if it's, a, if it's a, particularly if it's a person with living with disabilities, is a net cost to the business of about 3,200 Rand per learner per annum. However, the impact on your BE scorecard is significant. And companies that are engaged in those kind of learnership programs can earn significant points at a very low cost per point. Now, the implication means that companies don't have... A, or the, the, the obstacle to engaging in learnership programs has been removed because the tax incentives encourage companies to engage in learnership programs. And obviously one needs to engage with uh, credible service providers that deliver a credible result. But in a lot of ways this is where BEE, BEE makes a lot of sense because potentially companies can support the education of people that are unable to get jobs because their level of education is so poor. And by putting them on learnership programs, we lift these people into a, a position where they've now become employable. And companies that do employ learners or do find jobs for learners are able to claim the additional uh, absorption points, the bonus points in skills development. So in, in, in some respects, um, the tax incentives and the tax breaks for companies that engage in learnership programs are so significant that a, a lot of companies are encouraged to do so. The next significant element in the new codes of good practice is the new element called enterprise and supplier development which represents uh, an amalgamation of procurement and enterprise development from the old codes. Now what's particularly uh, important in this element is that there's an introduction of a new concept called an empowering supplier. And why this is important is because companies can only claim BEE points for procurement if they buy goods and services from a company that meets the definition of being an empowering supplier. It means that BE certificates in the future are going to have stated on the certificate whether a company is an empowering supplier or not. Um, and where a company is not an empowering supplier, that BE certificate will really be worth nothing because no one will be able to use it for procurement purposes. So if one looks at the actual scorecard for uh, preferential procurement contained in the new codes, the requirement is BEE procurement spend from empowering suppliers. BEE procurement spend from empowering suppliers that are qualifying small enterprises. BEE procurement spend from empowering suppliers that are exempt micro enterprises. BEE procurement spend from empowering suppliers that are at least 51% black owned or at least 30% black woman owned. So you can see the emphasis there is on this new definition called empowering supplier. So what is an empowering supplier? There is a definition provided in the new codes of good practice. And basically an empowering supplier is a company that is a good South African citizen company. Now what does that mean? And that's not defined. There are indications of what uh, a good uh, citizen South African company is. And that is a company that complies with all the regulations in the country. So one of the first criteria to being an empowering supplier is that your organization needs to comply with all regulatory requirements. That means licensing requirements, um, environmental requirements, tax requirements, employment equity requirements, skills development requirements, so all the regulatory requirements that a company should be compliant with. You need to be compliant with before you can be deemed to be an empowering supplier. Then there are four specific definitions which, are, which require companies to comply with at least three of them if they're large organizations or at least one of them if they are qualifying small enterprises.
before you can be deemed to be a qualifying, uh, before you can be deemed to be an empowering supplier. And those four criteria are as follows. Number one, at least 25% of the cost of sales, excluding labor and depreciation, must be procured from local producers or suppliers. And in the service industry, which is relevant to BEPs, the labor costs uh, can be capped at 15%. So basically what it means is, in delivering your services or, 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 or delivering your um, goods and services to industry, there's a requirement that at least 25% of what you procure must come from local sources. And the idea is obvious that government is trying to encourage companies to buy local. For big foreign multinational companies, this could be particularly challenging, where huge amounts of their products they sell into the South African market are imported, for, for instance. Then it would be very difficult for them to show 25% of their procurement is local. But for BEPs, built environment professionals, that is generally a very simple requirement because the professional services are procured locally. The second requirement is that of job creation and it says that uh, the requirement says that at least 50 percent of jobs created are for black people and provided that the number of black employees since the immediate, immediate prior BE verification um, is maintained. So that basically means that where jobs are being created in your organization that at least half those jobs are going towards black people. Now in the BEP environment that might be particularly challenging. Likewise, in a shrinking economy where companies are downsizing and, and employees are being let go, it's, it's highly likely that companies would not meet this particular criteria. Um, so that, that element could be, could be challenging. The third element is it says that at least 25% transformation of raw material beneficiation, which includes local manufacturing, production and or assembly and or packaging. Now in the built environment profe uh, professional space, um, that is not uh, an element that can be provided because generally uh, um, skills are being s uh, sold, services are being sold. There's no production or beneficiation taking place in the supply of, of what BEPs deliver to their clients. So therefore, most BEPs, I can't think of any BEPs really, that would meet that criteria. It therefore means that the large built environment professionals have to meet number one and number two, which we've discussed, and they have to meet number four. Um, to be able to qualify as an empowering supplier. And number four states that skills transfer must take place and at least 12 days per annum of productivity is deployed in assisting black-owned micro-enterprises and qualifying small enterprise beneficiaries. Now, what that effectively means is that a built environment professional company needs to take at least 12 days or 12 man days of expertise and assist qualifying black micro-enterprises. Uh, in their business. Um, so one could take one person for 12 days or 12 people for one day but the equivalent is 12 man days of expertise delivered to supporting uh, micro enterprises. Um, so those f uh, and to meet three of those four criteria means that you can qualify as an empowering supplier which will be declared as your as your status on your BE certificate and that means your BE certificate can now be used by your customers for their procurement. Without that status, your BE certificate is worth. Fortunately for micro enterprises and for startup enterprises, you, uh, those organizations are automatically deemed to be empowering suppliers. Um, so it's not, it's not a criteria uh, that they need to be concerned about. Another change uh, from the old codes to the new codes is that now companies are required to look at their supply chain for enterprise development purposes. So previously with the enterprise development target, in terms of, of enterprise development, the new codes have split enterprise development into two elements. The one is uh, supply development in which two-thirds of the points are earned and the other is enterprise development. Now what is the difference? Effectively, what the new codes are wanting to encourage companies to do is to look into their supply chain and see how they can engage in enterprise development activities that will uplift their black owned micro suppliers um, that supply goods and services to them. And um, in the new codes it's suggested that the 2% of the of net profit after tax is invested or um, spent in developing suppliers in the company supply chain. 1% of net profit after tax is then to be used in general enterprise development activities um, to uplift qualifying beneficiaries.
There are also bonus points available for companies that um, engage in an enterprise development beneficiary and then move them into the supply chain so that they can become a supplier to the business. Uh, you get a bonus point for doing that. And also, if you can show through your activities of enterprise development that you created a job within one of those uh, uh, suppliers in your supply chain, you get a further bonus point. The new codes also introduce enhanced recognition where companies um, engage in long-term contracts with their suppliers. So if you enter into a three-year contract with your suppliers, you can, you can take the spending that you do with that supplier and multiply it by a factor of 1.2. Likewise, if you take uh, an enterprise development beneficiary and make them an, uh, a, a supplier development beneficiary, um, you can multiply your spend with them by one point, a factor of 1.2. And if you engage in a black-owned or black-woman-owned uh, supplier for the first time, any spending you do with that supplier, you can also multiply that spending by a factor of 1.2. So those are enhancements that allow you to claim more points on your enterprise development scorecard. The last element is socio-economic development, and that element hasn't changed uh, at all from the old codes to the new codes. Still 1% of net profit after tax applied towards various charitable organizations. And for built environment professionals, the target is 0.25% of your levyable amount. Um, because generally um, the net profit after tax number is very variable for, for built environment professionals. So a much more stable measure is the, the levable amount of your payroll. Um, and it is unlikely that in aligning the sector code to the new codes that that will change. So one can see that the new BE codes of good practice have a much greater emphasis on skills development, uplifting people that were previously unemployed, developing suppliers within the supply chain, ensuring that companies engage far more actively in BEE um, than merely adopting a tick box, tick box approach. Um, companies that do not engage actively in a BEE process are going to find it very difficult to score a competitive score on their BEE levels. Uh, companies that don't address their ownership are also going to find it very difficult to score a competitive level on their BEE levels. So, the, the rules, the, 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 game, the, the game has changed, the, the playing field has changed and companies need to look at BEE far more as a strategic imperative where engaging in a BEE process can give you an advantage in business if it's done in a, in a systematic and sensible way. Um, we encourage companies to look at skills development, look at enterprise tax. development and unlock value in their supply chain as far more effective means of unlocking BE value and getting the BE recognition for it and at the same time enhancing their business. From a built environment professional perspective, uh, there is a requirement that your, sector, that your sector code, the construction sector code, is aligned to the new BE codes of good practice. And in doing that alignment process, you cannot vary significantly from what is now documented in the new codes of good practice. Um, and that alignment process, if it's not completed by 30 April 2015, means that built environment professionals and construction companies will be forced to use these codes of good practice as opposed to using their construction sector code. So it's, it's incumbent upon all members of the built environment professional environment to be engaged in that alignment process and assisting the, the Transport Sector Council to a... I just said transport. It is incumbent upon organizations and BEPs and construction companies to assist the Construction Sector Council in aligning to the new BE codes of good practice. So that by 30, 30 April 2015, construction companies and built environment professionals are able to be measured according to the requirements within their sector code.